Good morning, friends. Welcome you all to today's session, which is ninth in the series of 12 webinars. We have come a long way. The topic for today's session is edema fluid in wrong sites, and it will be conducted none other than Dr. Y.K. Ambekar. The session is brought to you by GP Clinics as an educational initiative through our own digital platform, docislive.com. As usual, the recordings of all the previous session, as you know, is available on our website, gpclinics.in. One important information I would like to give you that on 9th of April this month, we conducted a live CME program by GP Clinics at Hotel Novotel in Mumbai, and it was live streamed across India to more than 11 locations. It was attended by more than 600 delegates doctors and a lively question answer session was done and this complete session went for uh, more than two hours and all the questions and answers were well explained by Dr. Y.K. Ambedkar. And for information of all of you, the recordings of this session, which was on differential diagnosis in fever, is there on our YouTube channel, GP Clinics. And a summary is also being published separately as a four pager. So coming back to today's session, over to you, Dr. Ambedkar, sir. Floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal, and good morning, all friends. I think today's topic is edema fluid in wrong sites, which obviously means that there is something fluid accumulating in some other places other than where it should be. But what is more important to also make a note is sometimes the fluid is only in the wrong sites and not on in the right sites, which means the fluid is not there enough in an intravascular compartment, but it's all at the wrong sites. So let's get started with, as usual, uh, back to basics. Can I have the next slide, please? Have you know that edema is an increased collection of fluids in interstitial spaces, including the third space, which is pleura, peritoneum, etc. So sometimes the generalized edema may spill over beyond subcutaneous interstitial spaces to also a pleural and peritoneal cavity. Now, this results from an imbalance between the pressures in the extravascular and in the intravascular compartment. Now, just to brush up our basic physiology, the 85% of body weight is really an extravascular compartment, which consists of intracellular, interstitial, and transcellular spaces, and only remaining 35% comes through intravascular compartment, of which largely it is present in plasma, but also partly in small amount in lymphatics. So now, what gives this balance in terms of this extravascular and intravascular compartment is the capillary hydrostatic pressure, which pushes the fluid out of the blood vessels, while an osmotic pressure, largely caused by plasma proteins, pulls the fluid in. So 90% of the fluid leaks out of the arterial capillaries. Please make a note of that, even normally. 90% of fluid leaks out of the arterial capillaries, but it's largely absorbed all by venous capillaries and to a small extent by lymphatics. Thus, the leakage and the reabsorption, the balance maintained between a capillary hydrostatic pressure and an osmotic pressure keeps the balance in normal health well maintained. Naturally, we understand that increased capillary pressure or a decreased osmotic pressure results in edema. So now, every time there is an edema, you start wondering whether it is an increased capillary pressure or a decreased osmotic pressure, right? Let's get to the next slide, please. Now, the next slide is an interaction for you. Which of the following statement is wrong? Edema result from increased capillary pressure, 
और इंक्रीज कैपिलरी परमिएबिलिटी और लिम्फेटिक ऑब्स्ट्रक्शन और लन ऑफ द बाव योर टाइम स्टार्ट ना हो Well, we have a divided opinion. All right, I did say that increased capillary pressure and the reduced osmotic pressure are the two major things. But I wanted to bring out another point here that, besides that, sometimes the capillaries are very fragile and they permit the fluid exit out, which means increased capillary permeability also. Will lead to edema formation, not a common problem, but yes, less. And of course, the lymphatic obstruction also, because we said that small amount of reabsorption of fluid becomes possible through lymphatics, and if that ten percent reabsorption of fluid does not occur through lymphatics, then there is likely to be an edema developing. So the answer correct is. None of the above are wrong. You can have almost any of the two, right? Fine. So we are clear now that besides the two common balancing pressures, increased capillary pressure and decreased osmotic pressure, there are also small areas of increased capillary permeability and the lymphatic obstruction, which also causes edema to a small extent. Can I have the next slide, please? There is another interaction for you now. Which of the following statement is wrong? Oliguria. Now make a note. Oliguria means intravascular volume is reduced. Oliguria may be present in nephrotic syndrome, in cardiac failure, in capillary leak, or in myxedema. You want to know which is the wrong statement? Your time starts now. Excellent. Majority of you felt that in myxedema you don't have an oliguria. Very good, because myxedema is a different type of collection in the interstitial space or a subcutaneous tissue, and that is not simply an edema in the right sense, but it's certainly something occupying there, and that's why myxedema also has a edema, but. There is no intravascular volume lowered, and to that extent, while nephrotic syndrome, cardiac failure, capillary leak, all can have a lower intravascular volume, and therefore oliguria, myxedema does not have oliguria. Right? Good. So we are now through our basics clearly, and with these two interactions, let's get started with the next slide, please. Now a quick. Clinical approach. Okay, every time you have a patient with edema, first confirm whether it's a generalized edema or a localized edema. By localized edema, I mean only at one place. For example, only in one leg. That is localized. But if it is present in both periorbital region, around both the eyes. Then it is not localized; it generalized. So take a note that anywhere more than one site shows edema, it will be called generalized. It could be bilateral facial periorbital edema. It could be a bilateral pedal edema, but it is generalized. Whereas a localized is just one small part of the body. Of course, common is generalized, but in a generalized situation. Whenever there is an acute onset edema, that means a pathology develops all of a sudden within uh, 24 hours. Acute onset edema is always first visible around the eyes, 
as is the case with acute glomerulonephritis or a nephrotic syndrome or a capillary leak. Whereas if it's a gradual onset, then it's usually on a dependent part, like in a cardiac failure, or it's largely over the abdomen in the form of ascites, like in a chronic liver disease, or sometimes there could be bilateral pedal edema or a little facial bilateral periorbital swellema, but there are a lot of other skin, hair, behavior changes, and that is typically a protein allergy malnutrition. Degree of edema is also important. If it's very massive all over, then very likely it is a nephrotic syndrome, whereas in most other conditions, the edema is mild and not severe, though may be generalized. Appearance is important because in a nephrotic syndrome, even when there is a massive generalized edema all over, including ascites or even sometimes pleural effusion, the child is very comfortable, not sick at all. Whereas in a capillary leak syndrome, like after a dengue fever, a child is acutely sick, often with shock. And in a chronically sick condition like cardiac failure or a chronic liver disease or a protein energy malnutrition, the patient appears chronically sick. How important it is to find out whether a patient with edema is very comfortable and happy, or he is acutely sick, or he looks a chronically sick. Makes the probable cause evident just by that. And lastly, most of the edemas are pitting, but there are non-pitting edemas where there is a chronic obstruction, like a lymphatic obstruction, or in hypothyroid state, and to that extent, always confirm that the edema is pitting or non-pitting. Non-pitting edema is not common, but certainly means that the subcutaneous tissue is not as liquid as in other edema, but it's a little semi-solid. And if it's not liquid, then it's not easy to pit or to develop a pitting in, uh, when given pressure. So, pitting and non-pitting edema is another important issue to go by. And of course, everywhere in a clinical approach, you must talk about other important symptoms and signs. Like, while a renal disease acutely may present only with edema, the cardiac failure, chronic liver disease, or a protein energy malnutrition do not present only with edema, but many other symptoms are involved. Well, I think now we are through basics and we are also... I uh, have understood how to simply approach edema patient clinically. And as usual, now we will have eight different types of cases for you to interact so that you are able to understand how to apply knowledge of basic and clinical approach to solve the probable diagnosis in different cases of edema. Can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> now, this is your first case. An 18-year-old presented with facial puffiness <clears throat> noticed one morning on waking up. Also developed mild breathlessness the next day and also reported oliguria and high-colored urine. Please make a note. Acute onset of periorbital edema followed by next day with breathlessness and also oliguria and high-colored urine, so probably hematuria. On examination, blood pressure is high, but the child improved over four days. Okay. Now, I want you to pick up one of these four conditions. What is your probable diagnosis? Acute cardiac failure, capillary leak syndrome, post-streptococcal acute glomerulonephritis, or could be any of the above. Your time starts now. Excellent. You all got it so right. So right. Okay. 
if it was an acute cardiac failure, we said that the edema is almost never acute because it's a right ventricular failure, CCF, congestive cardiac failure, that takes time to develop. And an acute left ventricular failure does not present with edema, but presents with acute breathlessness, also called as cardiac asthma. So acute cardiac failure is not in this child. If it's a capillary leak syndrome, then it follows some viral infection like a dengue virus, and the story is first few days of fever and then some complications. Whereas this child started all of a sudden with edema, and therefore what starts as a periorbital edema and with oligoria hematuria is almost always an acute glomerulonephritis, and therefore the acute glomerulonephritis may present with breathlessness because of hypertension. So look at this combination of an acute renal disorder with a cardiac manifestation like breathlessness, whereas if the blood pressure is not very high, then the child may not present with breathlessness, but only present with periorbital edema, oliguria, and hematuria with mild to moderate hypertension. So I wanted to bring in this breathlessness only to kind of make you say that, oh, is breathlessness a cardiac condition? No. But this is a left ventricular cardiac problem and the cause is hypertension of an acute onset. And sometimes you might find an acute cardiac left ventricular failure coming up with acute hypertension, which is due to acute global nephritis. Right? Good. But most of you got it right. Let's have a next slide, please. Your next case is a three-year-old child who present with acute onset puffiness of face and oliguria that continued for two months. Take a note. The onset is acute puffiness of face and oliguria. But the story continues for two months. And physical examination at the end of two months showed hypertension, urine showed RBCs and pus cells, 8 to 10 per HPF, high power field. In this situation, what is your probable diagnosis? Delayed recovery in post epidemical nephritis or onset of chronic nephritis or a chronic urinary tract infection or any of the above. Your time starts now. Excellent. Again, see now, as, as we started with the basics and some clinical approach, most of you are thinking in a correct and right way, and I must congratulate all of you. Well, I am putting some other options only because they are very similar to the right answer, and therefore, I don't see anything terribly wrong with those who have answered something other than chronic nephritis, but this is a learning process. When four options look very similar to each other, one of them is absolutely no, not possible. But other three might look very close to one another and I want you to kind of pick it up correctly and I can see that both last two cases, this one and the last one, majority of you picked up so correctly. If this was a recovering post streptococcal glomerular nephritis, you would have started getting better and better. The edema is the first to disappear Hypertension is very early to disappear. But a little oliguria, hematuria might remain for a long time or a mild edema might remain for a long time. Okay, but hypertension is very early to disappear. Moment of acute glomerular nephritis starts improving in just for a few days. And that's why this was chronic nephritis. Good. Let's have a next case. Next slide, please. Now, this is an eight-year-old who presented with gradually increasing exertional dyspnea. Make a note. 
he started getting gradually difficulty in breathing with exertion increasing. He also had oliguria and edema of feet for the last two months. So story starts with not edema necessarily, but the presenting feature is a slowly worsening exertional dyspnea and also oliguria and edema. On examination, the blood pressure is high. There is cardiomegaly, but there is no murmur. Make a note of all this. Now, what's your probable diagnosis? Make a note. The story starts with not only edema and oliguria, but also with increasing exertional dyspnea. What does it mean? The story starts with oliguria and edema, but also had mild breathlessness, which has gone on increasing over the last two months. Okay, so your diagnosis could be chronic nephritis with hypertension, essential hypertension, rheumatic valvular heart disease with hypertension, or none of the above. Your time starts now. Excellent again. See how how correctly you are all guessing the whole story right. Essential hypertension is almost not severe in childhood. So today we know that essential hypertension is common in middle age and old age. But take a note that essential hypertension starts in late childhood. What does it mean? That if a child's normal blood pressure is say 100 by 60. By the time he becomes adolescent, and if he's a fat adolescent, obese adolescent, he's now developing not only 120, 80, but maybe 130, 80, which means over years, he has started going up on his blood pressure. But it is still not called hypertension because it is still within normal limits. So essential hypertension starts in late childhood and by the time you are a middle-aged adult, uh, you manifest symptoms of essential hypertension. So this is not a child with essential hypertension. Had it been a rheumatic valvular heart disease, rarely there is a hypertension in a rheumatic valvular heart disease. But what is most important is there are a lot of murmurs of a valvular affection. This child had no murmur, but just a large heart. And therefore, the correct answer is a chronic nephritis with hypertension. I wanted you to look at these three different types of nephritis, acute lobular nephritis, chronic nephritis, with hypertension, with mild breathlessness, and a chronic nephritis with hypertension with slowly developing breathlessness. All kinds of permutation and combination, but the story starts with edema and, and that's why I'm mostly renal cause. And we have learned that what starts suddenly as an edema, otherwise in a normal child, still proved otherwise, it's a renal disease, especially if, if it's associated with oliguria, hematuria, and hypertension. The only other cause of an acute onset periorbital edema is an angioedema, allergic edema, where there is no oliguria, hematuria, etc., no hypertension, and therefore the diagnosis is not very difficult, right? Let's get to the next case. Now, here is the next child, which is two year old, a small child, who presented with acute onset of puffiness of face, followed next day by generalized edema, abdominal distension, and oliguria. On examination, he was comfortable. There was a lot of edema all over. Blood pressure was also normal. What is your probable diagnosis? Acute post-streptococcal globulonephritis, protein malnutrition, nephrotic syndrome, or angioedema. Your time starts now.
excellent what a perfect thing not even one of you is wrong not even one of you is wrong what have you learned a large edema generalized edema too much of edema but a happy comfortable child is a nephrotic syndrome till proved otherwise he may have oliguria he may sometimes even have immature sometimes he has hypertension or many times he has none of these except generalized edema he has ascites he may have a pleural effusion but the bottom line is acute onset severe generalized edema but a very happy and comfortable patient is a nephrotic syndrome of what variety there are so many varieties of nephrotic syndrome we have nothing to do with it we want to pick up a nephrotic syndrome and ask the nephrologist to take care that's fine but how correctly you all have just guessed rightly and i think i am very very impressed by every one thinking right this proves me a point that i have always been talking about that we all know medicine equally or rather to be putting correctly we are all ignorant equally in medicine but what is the difference between few of us and many of us and some of us is that not every one of us thinks and i think this whole process of gp clinic webinar is only to kind of make you think the knowledge is equal and ignorance is enormous equal and only when we think we get right answer right very good can we have the next slide please now this is again an older child i i put many older children only because they are almost like adults and you have a mix of small children moderate the high children and also adults this is an 18 year old presented with acute onset of periorbital edema but urine output was normal and there were no other symptoms at all okay acute onset of periorbital edema but without any other symptoms and physical examination was also normal except the facial edema what's your probable diagnosis acute glomerulonephritis nephrotic syndrome angioedema or any of the above your time starts now wonderful again majority of you have said angioedema but i must also compliment to some extent those who have said acute glomerulonephritis so the correct answer is angioedema but what i wanted to bring out to in this child is that sometimes not commonly acute glomerulonephritis may not have immature here but often always have oliguria at least but hematuria may not be obvious because after all hematuria in acute glomerulonephritis visibly seen depends on how many rbcs exist in the urine sample if there are only few rbcs picked up microscopically then the urine may not be visibly high colored or cola colored but oliguria is often always there so but oliguria is not often even reported correctly after all in an 18 year old he passes urine maybe four times in 24 hour and today if he has passed three times he may not have noticed that his urine output has gone down and therefore you need to in such a case confirm that there is no by chance oliguria mists and that's why i also give some credit to those who thought of glomerulonephritis but this typical story of nothing else okay acute glomerulonephritis often will have oliguria so sometimes not reported but also often have mild edema feet also 
whereas an angioedema is a localized edema often to the lips etc okay but sometimes it can go even all over or even over the face all over right but good again a good thought angioedema is the right answer but few of you who said acute glomerular nephritis have possibly thought that would oliguria be missed on reporting yes slightly even in children the parents may not have noticed oliguria and it's a subjective feeling that a patient has passed less urine okay but one point to suggest oliguria is also the urine gets a little colored concentrated urine so oliguria is picked up in the history by asking the volume of urine passed as well as whether there is a change in the color of urine from a colorless urine to a little colored urine might mean it's a concentrated urine and a concentrated urine may suggest oliguria so again how important it is in this child or this person to ask in details about oliguria and confirm that there is an absence of oliguria and if there is an absence of oliguria and also absence of fetal edema then the diagnosis is angioedema but again i am quite impressed that you have few of you have brought out the discussion which goes beyond the average and i am so happy that this group who is attending this webinar has been always very actively thinking and trying to improve on themselves believe me at the end of 55 years of being a pediatrician and 60 years of being a doctor i certainly continue to learn even today and you know from whom i learn i learn from you all when you all ask a question i start thinking and i know sometimes that i had never thought about it so finally friends all of us are teachers and students with reciprocal uh, kind of situation that we probably dwell in right but good can we have the next slide please now here is another child who is again a bit was a young child one year old presented with loose stools for two days followed by edema of face and feet he was exclusively breastfed for first nine months and thereafter he got little dal water in addition to breastfeeding his weight was only 7 kilos at one year he could have been 9 to 10 kilos and his birth weight was very good 3 kilos so he should have been at least 9 or better 10 kilos whereas he is only 7 kilos now with this story of loose stools and two days later coming out with edema feet and a poor diet and a poor weight what is your possible diagnosis acute glomerular nephritis capillary leak syndrome protein malnutrition or any of the above your time starts now excellent again majority of you have said it's the protein malnutrition and what have we learned i i again would give some credence to those few people who called it an acute glomerular nephritis and i wanted to bring this patient specifically for that and anticipated at least few of you would give the answer of an acute glomerular nephritis because you have been impressed by my repeatedly saying that an acute onset periorbital edema is renal or angioedema till proved otherwise right very good but remember that this was not acute onset edema this was acute onset edema following a loose stool right so the first symptom was not periorbital yes you are right that acute edema developed acutely so that could be called acute onset edema but this was not the first presenting feature 
and that's why this was just to make a point that sometimes the edema may come up acutely even without being a renal cause and what is the reason because such a patient or a child has already a low protein in his body and a small excuse of losing some more protein in the form of an illness like a loose stools would make manifestation of edema come up so possibly a day before this child developed edema or loose stools he did have low proteins but that two days of loose stools made his low proteins even get lower and therefore he manifested with an acute edema but two things are important to note that this is not renal because one an acute renal disorder or angioedema starts with edema whereas this child started with loose stools i already said that protein malnutrition cardiac edema and liver edema often start with some more symptomatology rather than only the manifestation of edema besides chronic cardiac failure of chronic liver disease as well as a protein energy malnutrition are all patients who have not been doing well and therefore they are certainly sick looking or they are certainly having lot of other symptoms and that's why the right answer in this child was a protein malnutrition right but good again i i see a point that many of you who have given sometimes the wrong answer have also started thinking rightly but some finer points are missed and the whole idea of such a webinar is to even appraise you of some of such minor points which can make you fine tune your provisional diagnosis in much better way and much accurate way and i am very happy that few of you also gave a wrong answer which is very close to the right answer and therefore i must congratulate you also for putting up some such thoughts but you have learned now a small fine tune points which can make a difference between a final diagnosis and death well friends uh, we are largely in this webinar trying to make you understand how a good clinician can pick up of course investigation would have made the diagnosis very easy in all of this condition but i want you to learn also that you will order an investigation only if necessary and only relevant and that's why this kind of a webinar right fine let's get to the seventh case the next case please now this is a two year old child who presented with high fever followed by a macular skin rash that lasted for 3 days and recovered with symptomatic therapy so child came with what looked like a viral infection and that seemed to be recovering but very next day he developed a severe abdominal pain followed by edema feet and abdominal distension physical examination showed this child had a sick child look with ascites take a note started with a self limiting 3 days of fever with skin rash that might look like a viral infection and then as the story was improving develop some problem your probable diagnosis is post viral nephritis acute hepatitis capillary leak syndrome or cirrhosis of liver your time starts now yes we have a divided house and surely this was not an easy proposition but i wanted also to bring in such a case for that now what we knew is that this was a viral infection right and the viral infection then got better by itself 
Now, if a viral infection settled by itself, it had no reason to now develop another viral infective complication. You understand what I mean? If you, somebody develops a viral encephalitis, the viral infection is still acute and still active. If somebody develops a viral hepatitis, the disease has not got better. The disease is continued. If somebody gets a viral myocarditis, the fever continues. The disease continues. So, if this disease has continued, then this is unlikely that this is a post-viral hepatitis. But yes, but some post-viral complication. And rarely, a post-viral complication can also cause a liver damage, but generally it would cause jaundice by then. Okay, so you are right in thinking that what those who answered as post-viral hepatitis have considered that this is a viral infection which has complications. But friends, complications of viral infections are of two kinds. One, where the viral infection continues and spreads to the other organ. On the other hand, the other type of complication is where a viral infection settles down and then starts a complication, which is known as an immunological complication. So here we have learned two types of complications. One of infective complication, like a same infection continues and spreads to other organs. Whereas some is an immunological complication where the trigger factor of a viral infection disappears but starts with complication. Friends, in COVID, we have had a post-viral immune complication. Fever may disappear, but you may get some problem. And today we know that post-COVID, immune complication can come up even after days or weeks or sometimes even after months. And you know now that a myocardium can get involved even manifesting after few months of COVID. And therefore, a typical immunological complications occur after the primary infection has settled down. And this child did that. Now, acute hepatitis present with jaundice within 24, 48 hours. This child has not developed. So possibly it's not. And therefore, the right answer is a capillary leak syndrome where a patient suddenly develops a severe capillary leak that develops not only edema, but an abdominal pain is due to the hypoxemia of the intestine. Because of the capillary leak, the intravascular volume goes down, perfusion goes down, intestines are not perfused, so they are hypoxemic. If they are hypoxemic, they are also hypoxic, and therefore the muscles cramp and you get severe abdominal pain. Friends, this is typically an acute shock syndrome or due to capillary leak and might present only with edema, may present with shock, may present with hemorrhage, may present with ascites, various combinations of immunological complications. But what have we learned? When a primary infection seems to get better and recover, but after a gap of a day or two, develop something more, is called an immunological complication and can affect any any organ, right? Good. Let's have a next slide, please. And this is my last case uh, before we discuss the investigation, management, etc. This was an 18-year-old who presented with gradual distension of abdomen and edema of pain noticed over the last six months. There were no other symptoms. See this story, a gradually progressive abdominal distension and also edema of feet for the last six months, but there are no other symptoms. What does the physical examination show? The patient has lost two kilos. He has no jaundice, but he has a large liver. He has also splenomegaly, but there is no ascites. Take a note, chronic slowly progressive 
abdominal distension with edema of feet, with hepatosplenomegaly, without ascites, and having lost weight. Now, what's your probable diagnosis? Is it chronic hepatitis? Is it cirrhosis? Is it disseminated tuberculosis or any of the above? Your time starts now. Majority of two, you have said cirrhosis, and I I want to kind of debate all these three other conditions, and cirrhosis is the right answer. See, if it's a chronic hepatitis, by means of hepatitis and going on for a long time, jaundice is a rule. And therefore, this child has no jaundice, so there is no hepatitis, and the liver enlargement is without hepatitis, and that is typically of cirrhosis. That's number one. Why not a disseminated tuberculosis? Yes, disseminated tuberculosis also presents with hepatosplenomegaly and a loss of weight, but there is no edema of it. They present with sickness, maybe sickness like a cirrhosis. The liver and spleen may look like cirrhosis, both are enlarged, but the edema feed brings you down to a liver parenchyma that, that is involved. In cirrhosis, the liver cells, hepatocytes, are not functioning well. And the earliest symptom of a liver cells not functioning well is edema if it's a chronic disease. And if it's an acute disease, then it's jaundice. So acute hepatitis present with jaundice, chronic hepatitis over long time present with jaundice. But if there is a chronic hepatocyte dysfunction, not due to hepatitis, but due to fibrosis, cirrhosis, then the only first symptom is an edema feed. And if this child has edema feed, which means that the hepatic cells, hepatocytes are involved. But in a disseminated tuberculosis, it's not the hepatocytes that are involved, but it's the interstitial tissue that is involved. It's a reticuloendothelial tissue in between hepatocytes, in between venous channels. They are involved. And therefore, your thought process of it being disseminated TB is acceptable, but for the presence of edema in this child puts it out. Same way, a chronic hepatitis will present with liver and spleen, but with jaundice. So absence of jaundice in this child puts chronic hepatitis out, and presence of edema feet in this child puts disseminated TB out. And therefore, I don't think any of you could be considered wrong in our thought process, but fine-tuning tells me that this is neither chronic hepatitis nor disseminated TB, but cirrhosis. And cirrhosis without ascites means that the hepatic cells are still in a phase of compensated stage of disease, and therefore this is a compensated cirrhosis. When cirrhosis gets decompensated, you will develop ascites and also liver cell failure. Fine. So again, all answers are reasonably close to being right, but a fine tuning tells me that it is cirrhosis, right? Can we have the next slide, please? Now we are going to discuss investigation, but before that, uh, one more interaction for you based on investigations on this child. This was a five-year-old child who presented with puffiness of face, especially noticed on waking up in the morning that gradually disappeared over the day. And physical examination on day two, evening, was absolutely normal. Okay, look at this story. Waking up in the morning, puffiness of face, but by the time it's a day breaks and 
evening comes, Edema disappears completely. But because there was an acute onset puffiness of face, we decided to rule out a renal disorder. Right? We are right on that. So on day three, we did a routine urine examination which showed protein 1 plus, 4 to 5 per cells, RBCs 1 plus, and serum creatinine 1 milligram per cell. Our, the laboratory said normal is up to 1.2 milligrams. Yes. I want you to focus on this investigation because I have already said that the story looks like renal because of an acute onset, but behaving very slowly. And I must rule out by a routine urine examination. And here is some abnormalities. What is your probable diagnosis based on this urine report? <clears throat> Is it acute nephritis? Is it acute urinary tract infection? Is it a nephrotic syndrome? Or this is neither of the three and this child is normal. Your time starts now. Wonderful. Okay. Again, a uh, few of you have said normal child, but I wanted you to take care of some abnormalities in the urine examination. So can I have that slide again? The same slide. Can you put back the slide? Can you put back the slide? Yes, that's fine. Stay, stay with that. Don't, don't give... Uh, we are only discussing this slide. Now, see, there is one plus protein. I wanted you to learn that one plus protein may be normal or may be abnormal. You are not sure. I will discuss it in the next slide, how to be sure. Four to five per cells could be absolutely normal. Generally, 10 and above per cells would be called abnormal in a centrifuge specimen. Four to five percent may be normal, and many conditions would just give you four to five percent. It may not mean a UTI. RBC one plus could be also due to any febrile illness or sometimes due to many other trivial causes, but also could be abnormal. Okay, so now in this child, protein may be normal. Percils may be normal, RBCs may be normal, okay, but could also be abnormal. But what about serum creatinine? Serum creatinine is one milligram and the laboratory says up to 1.2 is all right, but that 1.2 is all right for an adult and not for a five-year-old child. That's why five-year-old child, one milligram creatinine is abnormal and that's why it becomes an acute glomerular nephritis. Okay. In the next slide, I will explain you how to investigate interpretations go by. Right? The next slide, please. Now, routine urine analysis. Chemical test for protein is unreliable. So, 1 plus 2 plus is unreliable. But in case you got some protein plus, you must order urinary protein creatinine ratio. Urinary protein creatinine ratio on a single sample will tell you whether this protein in the urine is normal or abnormal. And what is the normal ratio? Less than 0.2. And what is abnormal? Definitely more than 0.5. So between 0.2 and 0.5, you are not sure. You may have to repeat. You may have to follow clinically or with repeat urine examination, but if it is less than 0.2, you are okay. If it's more than 0.5, you are 100% abnormal. So every time if you see urine protein 1 plus and if you are suspecting some abnormality, you must ask for protein creatinine ratio on a spot sample. If it is very high, 
then it's a nephrotic cell wall, right? Yes. Now, few pustules or RBCs have no significance at all. I've already said that. And it does not tell you by itself anything. And therefore, whenever in an office practice in your own clinic, you get a report urine one plus, you can use a urine dipstick. It's a good for screening. You know that urine dipsticks are available. You can just put a stick in the urine sample and read the changes of color occurring on that strip and you will know whether the urine contains RBCs, urine contains protein, or urine contains bacteria. It's a screening test. You can't depend on it. But when you see only one plus protein, you can use urine dipstick. Urine dipsticks are freely available in the market, and each dipstick may not cause much. And to that extent, you can double confirm urine protein report in your own clinic. So that much about the urine report. But what about creatinine? No laboratory today in Mumbai, except one or two hospitals, give the age-related normals. Serum creatinine is age-dependent. And rough estimate is, if you look at the height of the child and make a three-fourth of that height and now use a decimals to change, then you will know that this is a normal serum creatinine. For example, if adult has a height of 160 centimeters and the three-fourth of 160 is 120, so now putting the decimals right, the normal maximum value of serum creatinine in adult is 1.2. You get the answer? Now, suppose five-year-old child is 100 centimeters or 105 centimeters. Let's call it 100 for simplicity. The three-fourth is 75. So, serum creatinine in a five-year-old child should not be more than 0.75. And this child had one milligram. I wanted to bring out two points in the routine investigation. Urinary protein must be confirmed with protein creatinine ratio and serum creatinine value should be confirmed with age dependent, height dependent, simple rough formula. <laughs> Measure the height in centimeters, make three fourths of it, adjust the decimal, and you get a maximum allowable normal serum creatinine for that age, right? Further, you can even pick up an each EFR, which means a glomerular filtration rate. <laughs> and this is for your some additional information that the first test that starts showing abnormality in a chronic urinary diseases like chronic UTI is, or a chronic nephritis is, and glomerular filtration rate starts going down. And how do you calculate? Estimated GFR. That means not correct GFR, but estimated. How do you do that? Estimated GFR in milliliters per minute is equivalent to 0.45 into height in centimeters divided by serum creatinine. Now, put this to an adult of 160 centimeters we talked about. Okay. So, adult eGFR would be 0.45 into 160 into say his serum creatinine is one milligram per cent which is normal then it is 160 divided by 0.45 so it is more than 80 normal egfr at any age is between 80 and 120 mil per minute this is important in Monitoring chronic renal disorders like chronic nephritis or chronic urinary tract infection. And this is one step ahead of an average practice, right? Lastly, sometimes we may have to pick up serum C3 level because in an acute glomerular nephritis, C3 level goes down. But as the nephritis improves, C3 level comes back to normal. So suppose your typical glomerular nephritis child 
or a patient has not been improving well and if you find that serum C3 level has not come up but has remained low, send him to a nephrologist, your diagnosis is a chronic nephritis, right? Can I have the next slide, please? And this is the last slide on management, not very important. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Well, nothing much to talk about except specific therapy depends on the diagnosis, but don't use diuretic for every edema. Oh, that's sometimes dangerous because diuretics are rarely required with an exception of an acute renal shutdown, which is not a common problem in office practice or sometimes in a severe nephrotic syndrome where the patient has a large ascites has a large scrofal edema and therefore he is very uncomfortable. You may have to give him diuretic, but don't give it routinely because diuretics can endanger life in a severely edematous child and he may need an intravenous albumin infusion before giving a diuretic. So in short, don't use diuretics because you find edema, but find the cause and then treat. Can I have the last slide, please? The take-home message in the last slide. Last slide, please. The last slide only takes you to say that acute onset periorbital edema, renal orange edema. If the presenting features are other than edema, think about something other than renal edema like cardiac, liver, and nutritional edema. Localized edema is often due to lymphatic obstruction. But edema is also seen in hypothyroidism and very morbid obesity. And lastly, the diuretic should not be used really in general, right? I think that's the end of our webinar today. I hand it over to Dr. Garwal. If there are any small number of questions, we may have five or ten minutes. And all other questions, of course, you will find it in the next GP clinic uh, which always takes care of all the details of our discussion and they always print out all this for your benefit for revision. Dr. Agarwal, please. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, there are a lot many questions coming in. Let us take a few of them. Uh, an interesting question is, why does edema due to acute renal disease start around eyelids? Very good. I think any acute onset edema, what is acute onset edema? 12, 24 hours back, I was a normal person and I certainly developed an edema. When edema develops acutely, it starts taking visible in a you know, in a subcutaneous tissue which has a lot of space to accumulate edema. And that is a periorbital space. Around our eyelids, there is a very much small available space in a subcutaneous tissue and therefore, any acute onset edema develops there. What is the importance? Chronic edemas don't develop acutely periorbitally, but they also have at the same time edema everywhere else. But if it starts only there, then it's almost renal. The only other condition is edema. But I want to bring one point here again, that even after a prolonged sleep, you might have a little periorbital puffiness. But that puffiness is largely only around the lower eyelids. Whereas the typical puffiness of an edematous child of an acute onset is upper eyelids as well as lower eyelids. Take a note of that. Upper eyelid edema is always abnormal. Lower eyelid may be you have been lazing around for a long time and it's a normal. Fine. Any more questions, Dr. Mm -hmm. One more question is, Yes. Can excitis alone be considered as edema? Yes. Now, um, see, uh, before that, let me give you one uh, clear idea. That to begin with, always I said, first talk about generalized or localized edema. Right? The question is, is ascites a localized edema? Is a pleural effusion a localized edema? No. The reason is that for peritoneal collection or a pleural collection arising out of a generalized edema, you need edema first elsewhere. 
the edema for sectomenates in the subcutaneous space, and if that is not enough space to occupy, then it starts occupying also in the peritoneal cavity or a pleural cavity. So if you find a scientist as the only evidence of collection of fluid without any other subcutaneous edema anywhere else, always consider it as a local cause. And what are the local cause? Not local edema cause. Local cause of an ascites is of two types largely. Infective, like a tuberculous peritonitis or any other peritonitis or portal hypertension, like pre-portal hypertension or a cirrhotic with portal hypertension or a severe nephrotic syndrome will not only have ascites, will have generalized edema. So, localized edema is only one part of localized leg, for example. That is what you see in typically elephantiasis. But when ascites is presenting to you as the only fluid collection without any other edema anywhere else, it is never, never a cause of edema. Well, there is one small exception. If you had a nephrotic syndrome with generalized edema and ascites, and you started steroids, within few days, all subcutaneous edema disappears quickly. But ascites takes a long time. And such a recovering nephrotic syndrome may present you with ascites alone, but he does give you a history that a week ago or two weeks ago, he had a generalized edema, right? I think, I hope it's clear, but all these Questions and many others will also come to you in a GP clinic every month publication. And the whole idea of GP clinic is not only to get you to this webinar, which is a live activity, but also to provide you a revision material. And therefore, I strongly plead that all of you are interested in learning and keeping up updated also kind of subscribe to GP clinic because it gives you an opportunity to revise. And friends, without revision, none of us can remember, none of us can be updated. Thank you very much, Dr. Agarwal. I am sure it's time now for us to be yeah, stopping this. We are already into more than one hour into this discussion. That's right. Yeah. So uh, rest of the a lot many questions are trickling and we'll can have them in a GP clinics next issue. So thank you, Dr. Amdekar, sir, for this wonderful session. We hope this interactive session would have made learning interesting for attending doctors to help empower their practice. On behalf of GP Clinics and DocIsLive.com, I thank all the doctors who have attended this session. Please note the date for our next webinar, which will be on 4th of May, Sunday, 11 a.m., same time. This topic, the topic would be abdominal distension, don't ignore. So thank you once again to all of you. Good day.